generic process is going through a procedure, I should say, can be applied to any process. But we're going to look at this case where we've got two variables, temperature and substrate concentration. Our aim is to find a point of operation where those two variables leads to maximum compass per day. So you'll be doing this in um, a, a short little exercise that's going to be posted online later today or tomorrow, where you're going to be optimizing the process following the same procedure. You're going to be walking blindly to trying to find the optimum. Here we've got a bit of help. We know where our optimum actually is. So these contours are given to us, but in, in, we never know that in practice. What we're just working through is this procedure now to show how it works. So we have a baseline where we're operating, and we're, at that baseline we're getting $407 per day. We then said last class we had a factorial positioned around that, and we ran the 10 Kelvin range on the, on the temperature variable, and we ran 0.5 grand per meter range on the substrate concentration. So just to recap that then, over here on the substrate concentration we ran 0.5 at my low level, and 1.0 high. In actual units, on the low level, we had 320 Kelvin and 330 Kelvin. This is in, in real world units down here in, in the red boxes. So, a lot of today's class is going to be linking our real world operation into our coded variable operation. So, our model is in coded variables, but we recognize we work in the real world. We have to tell our operators or ourselves where to run the next experiment. So we're always going to be flipping between coded units and, and real world units in today's class. So we said last class we ran out of those experiments. The temperature for the first experiment at the baseline is 0, 0. Then we've got minus 1, plus 1, minus 1, plus 1 for the temperature in coded units. Substrate concentration was minus, minus. Plus, plus. There's also an intercept that we can estimate. The intercept term has values of 1, 1, 1, 1 for all of those five experiments. So the first column of my X matrix. Here's the second column of my X matrix, the temperature. The third column is TS. And then there's a fourth column, the TS interaction. And then my Y vector. So the TS interaction is 0 times 0 for that first experiment plus 1 plus times minus gets the minus the minus times plus is minus plus plus is plus. Then I recorded my y variables, my response at that profit was 07 <coughs> baseline, and then the standard order was 193, 310, 468, and then 571. So that's where we ended off the previous class, and I asked you to go home and, and calculate what would be the coefficients in the least squares model that fits those five data points. So five data points, four coefficients in the least squares model. You should be able in no time to calculate for yourself that y hat, the predicted y, is equal to B0 plus the temperature effect times xt in coded units plus the substrate slope coefficient Bs multiplied by Xs, plus the two-factor interaction Bt, Xt multiplied by Xs. And you should get the, that E0 is 390, Bt is 55, Bs is 134, and the two-factor interaction is a very small negative value, minus 3.5. So BT, that value of 55, you can quickly obtain in an exam by simply saying minus 193 plus 310 minus 468 plus 571 divided by 4. BS is 0 for the S multiplied by 407. Minus 193 minus 310 plus 468 plus 571. The intercept is slightly different. The intercept we can add five values. Simply take the values of 1, 5, 407 times 1, plus 193 times 1, 310, plus 468, plus 571, divided by 5. 
So those values there in this equation can be calculated very rapidly. And you've got to be good at doing this because you build this models at least three, four times in answering one of these types of questions. And you will do this as well when you, uh, in the next few days, when you're working through that example of the So this is my model that describes this local region around my factorial area. If you were doing this in R, one way you can build that model is to go as follows. I'll post this code as well, so again, you don't need to write it down. Write out your temperature effect, your substrate from the standard table. I've uh, put my zero, zero right at the end. Um, so there's my minus, plus, minus, plus, zero. And then the S is minus, minus, plus, plus, zero. It doesn't matter which order you do it, as long as you're consistent. So my Y vector goes 193 through 10, 4, 6, 8, 5, 7, 2, 1, and then I put 407 at the end. So specify those, specify your model. I would like a model where Y is described by T plus S plus the T times S two factor interaction. So a summary of that, then if I run that section of the code, it tells me I've got one degree of freedom, which I expect. With five experiments, four parameters, so one degree of freedom, good R squared, standard error of 19 units, and there's those values I've written up there in the equation. 319, 5, 134, minus 5. So either in R or by hand, um, you can get those numbers pretty quickly. The next thing we'd like to do is get a bit of a visualization of what that surface looks like. So here's code that you can use for that. It does um, basically does like a mesh grid type of operation. So there's I'll post MATLAB code for this and I'll post R code for this. Um, you know, you can use your preference. So this does a mesh grid type effect where I'm showing my response surface visually as a contour or a graded, a color graded plot. So if I run that, I get, um, I'll show you over here. So here's my point of operation. That's where I'm getting the $407 deposit. There's my factorial of the four points around it. And we're going to show in today's class where we find that fifth experiment to run. So we, we, we said last class we wanted to move in this direction. By how much do we take a step and in which direction do we take a step is what we're going to discuss today. So we've got a good idea where to run next, we just don't know exactly where. Where should we place our next experimental point is what we're trying to answer now. So let's take a look at that. What we do is we use the fact that we've got a link between my coded units over here. Notice here my x-axis is in terms of minus one, zeros, plus ones, plus twos. How do I link this particular plot back to real world units? Well, our link, of course, is the standard equation we've seen before, x subscript t is given by T in real world units. So I'll use capital letter T's here to emphasize real world units. And anything with a subscript T will emphasize coded units. So capital T in real world units is measured in Kelvin minus the center for temperature divided by half range for the temperature. That's my link between real world units and coded units. I have the same thing for substrate concentration. So x subscript s is substrate concentration multiplied by the center of s divided by the half of the range. In this particular case, center t corresponds to the midpoint where I ran my experiment. And range t corresponds to that 10 Kelvin range. So center in this case is midway between 320 and 330 Kelvin is 325. And for substrate, those center S and, center and range S was, the midpoint was 0.75 grams per liter. And the half range, oh sorry, the full range uh, was 25. So that's how I get from real world units to, to coded units. Now, we showed 
last class that intuitively we expect to move in this direction and we drew some contour lines to help us find that. So remember, we said pass through a point 407, we pass somewhere over there. 310, we go somewhere here. 468. So it's quite clear that we've got a gradients going in that direction. Even if you have a tough time visualizing what these gradients are, you can simply take these five values, plug them into R, and generate this sort of plot, and, and it will generate a more accurate representation for you. So either you can use computer software to do this, or you can visualize it by hand in that manner we did yesterday. It is clear, however, our direction of steepest descent is somewhere in that direction. We take a bigger step in the S direction than in the T direction. So we need to go a little bit more in S for every step in T. So one way we express that is delta XS, for every change we make in, in XS, we need to make a corresponding change in XT. And you can prove to yourself that that direction of steepest descent is the partial derivative of Y with respect to dy with respect to dxs divided by dy dxt, which in this case is approximately equal to the slope coefficient for the substrate divided by the slope coefficient for the temperature. So I emphasize that that's actually approximately equal because if we take the true partial derivative of y with respect to xs, there is actually a two factor interaction between them. So the derivative with respect to xs, b0 falls away, this term falls away to zero. We're left with bs here. But we are actually left with a small term over here for the two factor interaction. But because this is so small, minus 3.5 relative to the 134 over here, we simply ignore the two factor interactions. And that's standard for when we're estimating our direction of steepest descent is we only consider the main effect directions and we ignore the fact two factor interactions. I'll talk about what happens when that two factor interaction, two factor interaction is significant. Then you're dealing with a whole very different surface and direction of steepest descent don't make sense. But for now, we're pretty much on a linear incline. We want to find what direction should we go in. That direction, every step we make in XS, we have to make as corresponding change in XT. And that ratio is equal to the ratio of the slope coefficients. So in this case, Vs is 134 divided by 55. It shows that we need to make a slightly bigger step in XS for every corresponding step in S. Now, let's just talk about this coded units over here. So remember, everything with the subscript is coded units. We can show what is the relationship between my coded units, this change in coded units, with the change in real world units. And so I'm going to have to make a change in reality. What does that relate to in coded units? Or if I make a change in coded units, what's the relationship to the change in reality? Well, again here, it's, it's no problem to show that delta xt is equal to delta t, so notice capital T, not a subscript here, referring to actual units, so I'll emphasize that. Delta t actual is equal to the range of temperature divided by 2. So simply take that formula on the board on the left there and, and take the delta of it, and the center point falls away in both instances, and we're left with change in coded units is a change in real world units divided by the half range. Similarly for delta xs. So delta xs is equal to delta capital S actual divided by the half range of s. So the approach with response surface methods is as follows. Calculate your model, take the partial derivative of it, in other words, find, essentially take the slope coefficients. Then what we do is we pick a step size either in real world units for one variable, 
and find encoded units for it, or we make a step size encoded units and find the real world change. You can do either one, right? There's no correct way of doing it. But for any one of the variables in your model, so in this case I've got two variables, x, s, and x, t, for either one, choose a step size, either in real world units or in coded units, and then find the, the corresponding change in the other in the other one. So if I make a change in real world units, find a change in coded units. Once I've found delta xt, I can then go find what delta xs is through this formula above. Okay. So I will make a change in delta x of one coded unit. So in other words, I'm planning to run my next experiment. Here's one coded unit, so 0, 0, this point in the center is my baseline. That's one unit. I'm going to make a change in the temperature direction of one unit up. So I know that my next experiment is going to be one unit up in temperature from the baseline. So here's my, sorry, I, I visual, I showed you that wrong, so don't look at my hands pretty. Let's redo that. Here's one unit in temperature, is this direction, horizontally. So there's zero, there's one. I'm going to make a change of one unit from my baseline. Here's my baseline, I'm going to make a one unit change. So I'm going to be somewhere along this vertical direction. That's my choice. I'm going to make a delta xt change of one unit in the horizontal direction. I just don't know where that lands me up in the vertical direction. I know that it's going to be somewhere along this vertical line at one xt axis in temperature axis. Where is this point up here? Well, let's take a look at that. Calculation is quick. We use this formula above. you're moving from the baseline, the center point over there. So I've chosen that. Well, what is delta xs then? Delta xs over delta xt is equal to the slope coefficient for substrate over the slope coefficient for temperature. So that implies that delta xs is equal to 134 over 55 times 1. What is that then in real world units? So for both the temperature and the substrate, we need to know what that delta is in actual units. Well, for temperature, delta T actual is equal to 1 times the half range, so that's range of t over 2, that's equal to 10 over 2 is 5. So I'm going to make a plus 5 Kelvin increase in temperature. For substrate concentration, delta S actual is equal to 134 over 55 times the half range of S. That's equal to 134.5 over 55. The range of S was 0.5 over 2. That gets me a value of 0.61 grams of heat. Write this as follows, T5 in actual units, so capital T here, not a subscript. My next experiment is my baseline, T0, plus delta T actual. My baseline previously was 325 Kelvin, plus 5, so my next experiment is at 330 Kelvin. That's what I tell my operators to learn the process at for the next experiment in real world. Substrate 
S5 is equal to S0 where I started plus delta S actual. My midpoint over there was 0.75 grams per liter plus this delta now of 0.61. So my next experiment is then at 1.36 grams per liter. Now, good practices, and not good practice, required, I should say, is that you predict what your experimental result is at that next experiment before you even run it. So I know that my next point is up here, but I can use this model to make a prediction of what I, sh what I should expect. These conflict plots tell me already that I should expect a value of between $700 and $800 in profit. So I can see that this next experiment lies roughly midway between the 700 and 800 on the contour line. So I expect a profit there of about $750. Let's just check actually what that is. So what we do then is we need to use our model. I need to know what XT is and what XS is at experiment 5. my center point, 325, divided by the half range, 10 over 2. So xt is equal to plus 1 for my next experiment. So the coded units, this experiment is at plus 1. In real, in, uh, for substrate, xs, for the fifth experiment, is equal to, we said, uh, 1.36 grams per liter in real world units minus the center point of 0.75, divided through by the half range. So XS for the fifth experiment of coded units is 2.44. That's So that's that point over there, X5. So 2.44 on the X, S axis, this vertical axis, and then plus one on the horizontal axis. What is my predicted value of profit? So y hat for the fifth experiment is then this is my linear model to say 390 plus 55 times 1 plus 139, the slope coefficient for S, multiplied by 2.44 XS plus this two-factor interaction, minus 3.5 times 1 times 2.44. So that shows me my profit out there on the fifth point is made up of four parts. There's this base profit, which is the profit at my center point over here. Then I add additional portions to it. The reason why I'm writing this out slowly is we can then actually see how much gets added from each effect. So this is the temperature effect over here, this is the substrate effect over here, and this is the temperature substrate effect. So the portion that gets added due to temperature is an additional $55 for taking that one step in temperature. And then we get quite a big jump just by changing substrate of 327. So that 2.44 units <coughs> of substrate, encoded units, boosts my profit by quite a substantial amount, an additional $327. And then I get a bit of a decrease due to the two-factor interaction of eight and a half dollars. So it's telling me I expect a profit of 764 if I operate at that point. So before I even do it, I should go make a prediction out there of what I get, should expect. But now I run my experiment, and unfortunately I find y5, so this is not y hat, this is y hat 5, so my predicted 5, the actual 5 was a little, was not a little low, it was substantially low, $669. Now 
That's a difference of $95. So yesterday's class we said models are useful to a point. Right? So we use our models to, for, for some use, but they're wrong. Our model here has actually not worked out quite as well. We predicted $765, we're getting uh, $670 actually, that's about a $95 difference. How do I know that that's substantial? To me that $95 is a big deal because my main effect of temperature is about $55. So this is telling me I'm off by about two main effects in temperature. That to me is a big deal. If I was off by about $30 or $25, I'd say my model is pretty good. My model is, is smaller than one step in one of the main effects. But this difference of $95 is off by about two steps of the temperature main effect. And to me, that's a big deal. It's telling me my model is broken down. Okay, so we, we have to, I mentioned this last time, we have to recognize when our models are not useful for us anymore. So here's what you should have in mind. Here's your surface we're trying to optimize. We're going up this mountain. Here's my, my linear model. Okay. It works at a tangent, but at a certain point, I'm over-predicting and my surface is actually quite far below me. There's a $95 difference vertically between where I expect to be on the green slope, this green linear plane, versus this curved surface below me. Okay. So that's how we can start to tell my model is not successful when it's breaking down like that. So what I should have done at that point is stop and rebuild my model. Okay. And you, you should do that. <coughs> Naively though, when I wrote these notes two, three years ago, I went on and did step six and step seven. But those are two wasteful runs. Okay. The reason why I did step six is because I said, well, I'm, I've increased. Point number five, this experiment, even though I got $660, $670 here, it's still much greater than any one of these five points that I had over here. Okay, so to my mind, I'm, I should just still keep going in that direction. Okay, so let's see what happens at point six. We'll just quickly work through the calculations. We don't need to go into too much details on that. But essentially, how I found point six was following the same process I just followed now where I chose to go an additional step of plus one units in xt. So here going from zero to, uh, to experiment five, I took a delta xt of one unit. Going from five to six, I took another step of an additional unit in, um, in temperature. So what I did over there is I said 4.6. Let delta xt equal an additional one, so it went one unit up. You can show then that delta xs is equal to 2.44, again in the same way. So then T6, the temperature at the sixth point is equal to the temperature at the fifth point, plus delta T actual. Well, that's equal to, what was my temperature at the fifth point? T5. That was 330 Kelvin. Plus an additional 5 Kelvin. So 335. S for that sixth point was, what was my substrate at the fifth point? So S5. Plus an additional delta S actual. Well, S5 was equal to 1.36 grams per liter plus an additional 0.61. So we, we found what delta 
S actual was earlier, which is 0.61. So I just keep going in this direction, the same direction going from the baseline to step five, I just keep going an additional amount up to step six. So that's how I know where to run my next experiments. So 335 Kelvin and at 1.97 grams of liquid. I can make my prediction then of the profit I should expect, so Y hat at step six. <coughs> and that you can show is $390 plus 110 due to the temperature plus 654 due to substrate minus 34 due to the two-factor interaction. So my predicted profit at step six is equal to $1,120. But when I actually run my process at step six, so Y6, I get 688. So I make a prediction of 1,100 but my actual profit that I get at that sixth point is actually substantially less. Really indicating to me something major is going on <coughs> below me. So remember we said we've got this analogy of a blind person walking. If you were blind walking up this hill, the fact that at point five you get a profit of $670. So 670 over here, and you're getting 680 over there. You expect that to be a thousand you're only getting 600. What does the surface look like below you? You're getting roughly the same value at 0.5 and at 0.6, yet you expect this dramatic increase. So it's indicating that you've overstepped the optimum or that you're leveled off yet some way. And you don't know. We don't know what the reality is below us. So when you're going to get these numbers from your processes, when you're implementing this in practice, you're going to just get these numbers. You have no idea what the contour look like, looks like below you. You have to use these numbers to visualize the surface for yourself. So the fact that 0.5 and 6 numerically are returning the same y values or similar y's indicates to me I've either leveled off or I've overstepped the optimum and started going downhill again. When you get to an optimum, what is the characteristic of an optimum? If you're trying to climb a, a mountain, what is the characteristic of the peak? That if you move in any other direction, you'll decrease. Starting to go downhill in every other direction. The definition of an optimum, if you're taking the 4G course, is that your partial derivatives with respect to any variable are zero at an optimum. Okay, so you're leveling off. Your slope is flat. And so the fact that going from 5 to 6 indicates that my slope looks roughly flat means I've either overstepped the optimum or I actually am at the optimum somewhere. So when you're getting to a curved area of your process, you'll start to see these characteristics happen. The other thing is, if you had, by some amount of luck, started your process pretty much at the optimum, and then you put your factorial down around it, every other point in your factorial would be below your center point. Okay, so again, they would want to you, at the optimum, everything else around you is lower. So if you find your factorial, your center point is high, and everything else around you is low, that's a great indication that you're at the optimum. So what do we do when we get to the optimum? Well, optimums by definition are curved. So when we're here down in the low area, we can pretty much approximate this with a linear model. So these green lines that are shown here, those green slopes represent that least squares model we had up there on the board earlier. So I've drawn what that least squares model looks like in this local neighborhood. And notice that those green lines coincide quite nicely with the actual contours. So your linear model is a good approximation in that neighborhood. 
when we start to get up to the optimum, that linear approximation breaks down and we need to actually fit a non-linear approximation. So what I need is these red curves, which are a model of my reality. So the gray is the reality, which I don't know. These red curves represent a model of the reality that's a better approximation. Well, at an optimum, by definition, we're going to experience curvature and non-linearity. I need a non-linear model at, at the optimum. So let's back step again and see how we get to a, that non-linear model. Firstly, we recognize the need for the non-linear model because as we climb up the optimum, our model starts to break down. That tells me I need something better. Well, what do I do then? I find that at point six I'm starting to level off. So I say, well, let me stop. My model is clearly broken down here. I need to refit my factorial. Okay, so the moment you find your model breaking down, stop and refit the factorial. So that's what points eight, nine, 10, and 11 are We stop at point six, and we refit our factorial eight, nine, 10, and 11. So what I will do then is I will just give you those values that are also in the course textbook. So I'll give you the data for points 8, 9, 10, and 11, and point 6, and give you the final least squares model from that. And then you can go double check these numbers yourself. So at point number 6, I've got a temperature, and I've got a substrate, and I've got a y value. So Point number six is my baseline. So I've got experiment six, seven, eight, sorry, six, eight, nine, ten, and eleven. So in coded units, that corresponds to zero minus plus, minus, plus. And I'll also put in the real world units over here. That was 335 Kelvin is where we landed up at point six. Then I choose to do a new factorial at points eight, nine, 10, and 11. The other characteristic of an optimum is that optimums change fairly rapidly. So your factorial should not be big. You should start to bring in your factorial. Remember we saw this actually in the previous class when we were looking at the and this model over here, as we start to approach the optimum, your step sizes should get smaller and smaller. You've got to get a little bit more conservative as you approach the optimum. When you're far from the optimum, you're marching up this hill, you can take pretty big steps and be okay. But when you start to approach an optimum, you have to take smaller steps. Not taking smaller steps means you're going to overstep the optimum. Okay. Many chemical processes of importance, you approach the optimum and you rapidly fall down a mountain. So many processes peak up and then they fall right down. So again, taking big steps means you're going to see yourself going up and then you're going to suddenly get a low value. So again, take smaller and smaller steps when you're getting up the mountain. Here's actually a good example of that here from this React design. As we're approaching up, if I just took big steps here, and then I suddenly took another big step, I find myself fairly far down on the other side of it. So that's, that's actually quite typical, is that we run our processes right at that edge of the cliff, and we can often find ourselves falling over the edge if we take too big a step. So here's the same deal. Let's bring in that factorial and make it slightly smaller. So 335 was my baseline, minus at 331 in actual units, plus at 339. So that's an 8 Kelvin difference, whereas previously I used a 10 Kelvin difference. 331, 339, My substrate in coded units is 0, minus, minus, plus, plus. And in real world units, that corresponded to 1.97 at the center point. But then the lower bound and upper bound was 1.77 and the upper bound was 1.17 and the upper bound was 
then the y values are recorded from that of 688, 694, 725, 620, and 642. Why, why wouldn't we run um, a second factorial experiment right away? So it, I can't really read the board, but if you look at the top right-hand corner of the first factorial we did, and then you take 0.5, why not make that the left-hand side of a second factorial? Yeah, that's what I should have done. So what I'm showing you here is a little bit further out, but in hindsight, we already realized our model had broken down to 0.5. That's where I should have run my factorial. But even if you didn't know it was breaking down, why wouldn't we have gone to just continue doing these factorials? Because then around? you're doing four experiments instead of one. If your model is still valid and you're going up the mountain, you take steps of one step, one step. Do a single experiment, check. Does it match with my model? If so, keep going. Take a step. If so, keep going. If I did factorials at every step, I'm doing four, four, four. That's wasteful. I could do one, one, one. And I would just keep going. As long as my model predictions are OK, I just you get by with one. And we never use the next experiment as a corner point in a factorial? Yeah, so here, I'm getting to 0.5. I will show you then in a, probably on Friday's class, we can certainly, if I had gone to step five and realized my model had broken down, it would be more sensible to put a new factorial when we're using 0 0.4, 0 0.5, one over here, one over there. And that model would have pointed me in this direction. So I could have got to the optimum probably in about nine to 10 steps in this example. I'll show you that what I've done is pretty wasteful and I've used about um, 17 steps. But I could have done it in a small number, for sure, by being smart about the other So here's my data for that point. I can build a least squares model. So that model is in the course notes. And I use that model then to go run this next experiment, 12. So I step out to kind of number 12 a little bit. Let's take a look at what happens at point 12. So using, using that table over there. <clears throat> I would find that in coded units, my number 12, so x12 in coded units, the temperature is equal to plus 1, the temperature in 12 at the actual units is 339. So the calculations to get this are identical to the ones we've seen before, so there's no need for me to repeat these calculations. If you want to see them though, they are in the, in the course textbook. So x12 and then xs at the 12th point, that corresponds to minus 3. The substrate concentration at the 12th point corresponds in real world units to 1.37 gram per meter. If I use that xt and xs in the, in the least squares model, so let me just actually write that model down for you so you can double check your ability to calculate these models at home. So the model is y hat is equal to 674 plus 13 times xt minus 39 times xs minus 2.25 xt xs. So quite clear here that this model is telling me to increase temperature but decrease substrate concentration. So that's exactly what I've done, is I've increased temperature, but decreased substrate concentration to get to 0.12. And the ratio in which I move that delta xs of the delta xt is equal to minus 39 over 13, that corresponds to minus 3. So it says take minus 3 steps in s for every plus 1 step in t, is what this is saying to you. That's exactly what I've done over there. You can see that this magnitude in the S direction is three times as great as the magnitude, that narrow magnitude in the T direction. So for every one unit change in T, we must make a minus three unit change in S. So that's what I get from that least squares model. If I, do, if I use this model, I will predict that Y hat for the 12 points 
is equal to $797 for eight over there. But when I actually implement my experiments at 12 points, I get $716. This is a difference of $81. Again, that's substantial. That's about two times this effect of substrate. Substrate has an effect of about 40 units of profit. I'm getting an $80 difference there. It's roughly two times that substrate effect. That's pretty substantial deviation. Again, indicating to me I've my model has broken down. For this particular step size, I've stepped too far away from my model. It's really not accurate anymore. So now I have quite a good amount of evidence. I've spent a budget on 12 experiments, and I've recognized how my slope is moving. I'm clear that I've got an optimum somewhere over here. I'm just not sure exactly where it is. Going from 0.6 to 12, Let's take a look at point six. I got a profit of $680. Every other point around there was 694, 725, 620, 642. Let me add point 12 here to this table. And my actual profit there was 716. Interesting. By going to step towards point 12, my profit was $716. It's actually about the same as the profit I experienced at point 9. So this corner of the model. So the profit here at point 12 is roughly the same as point 9. Again, this is giving me a bit of evidence what the shape of the surface was like below me. And so people get frustrated with responsiveness methods because they don't know which directions to move. The main problem comes down to you're not looking at your numbers. Plot these numbers out on a map for you to get an idea of what the surface looks like. If you only have the profits at these point points, you have to mentally build up what that contour looks like below you. So what I'll uh, talk about tomorrow is why we add those star points. So we add star points to our model. Those star points allow me to build a non-linear model now that has temperature squared terms and substrate squared terms. So I can use this non-linear model now to better estimate my surface. <laughs>